I'm Caitlin McKenzie Keys. And I'm John Morris. And this is Spoke TV, your source for local weekly news produced by second year journalism broadcast students from Conestoga College. Close to 800 people recently became bone marrow donors in hopes of finding a match for a four year old girl in Cambridge. Spoke TV's Amari Nicolau visited the Cambridge Sports Park where the clinic was held. On February 23rd, hundreds of people came to the Cambridge Stem Cell Clinic for Katie Heron, a four-year-old girl who already had been through so much fighting for her life. Katie was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia when only 15 months old. After 25 months of intensive treatment, Katie fought the cancer into remission. Unfortunately, last November, the cancer returned, and her only hope is a stem cell donor. At a stem cell drive, they were trying to get as many people as they could to register in a program called One Match, which is a national network for bone marrow donations. Volunteer Julie Merkel explains who can register. Um, they need to be between the ages of 17 and 35. Um, we're doing men and women, but, but they would like ideally to have um, men 17 to 35 make the best donors. Um, they have to be in good general health and willing to, uh, willing to help anybody. We don't want somebody that's only willing to donate to Katie because they could be matched to anybody anywhere. The people who came to the clinic waited at least 40 minutes to register themselves. But those waiting didn't care how long it took. All they were hoping was to be a match for Katie. Katie's father, Paul Heron, is really thankful to everybody that came and offered their support. Thanks each and individual person uh, for coming out today, uh, doing this not only for Katie, but for many of the other families that might need this uh, important stem cell transplant. Um, and I hope that all of you guys are a match for somebody. Katie is at the Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto, where she'll have the transplant when a match is found. If you'd like more information about One Match program, visit onematch.ca. For Spoke TV, I'm Amari Nicolau. Since coming to the Waterloo region in 2005, Google has played a big role in the growth of the area's technology community and hopes to continue this trend with their latest development. An international tech giant is increasing its local presence in the Kitchener-Waterloo region. Google has made plans to expand its office just blocks away from its current home at the Tannery. Sticking with a brick and beam style building, Google chose the Bright Up Block, a former rubber plant from the early 1900s. The company signed on to lease more than three quarters of the facility as well as some space that has yet to be built. An additional three floors will be added to the building, increasing the space by 36,000 square feet. Construction is expected to begin in the near future. Some students at Conestoga have taken the plunge for a good cause. The annual February Polar Plunge has raised money for breast cancer for the past 30 years. Spoke TV's Kelly Burns bears the cold for a good cause. Conestoga College holds an annual polar plunge on Dune campus in the frigid month of February, and temperatures this year are even colder than normal. It's minus 13 outside Conestoga College, where students and faculty will be jumping in this pool behind me for the polar plunge, with all proceeds going to charity. Participants in the Polar Plunge raise money through donations that all go to the Breast Cancer Society of Canada. Conestoga's CSI coordinator, Sam Schwier, tells us about the event. Yeah, um, well CGIQ will be here and they're doing like the announcing and music and kind of pump up stuff. Um, and then we have uh, embroidered towels this year and buttons for the jumpers. And then we have uh, soup and hot chocolate and water and stuff like that for them as well. Plungers like Conestoga College student Murray Hegan know it's cold and maybe a little bit crazy to jump into a pool in the middle of our Canadian winter, but knows it's for a good cause. Cancer affects everybody. I mean, it touches everybody's lives. So, I mean, it's, it's for a good cause. Research is where, you know, all the, uh, all the money goes to. So, I mean, it's a worthy cause. Absolutely. Sometimes people add their own flair to the cause, like Murray Hegan who dressed up as menopausal Miley, swinging a sledgehammer and wearing a wig and clothes that resembled Miley Cyrus's in the Wrecking Ball video. When I saw her uh, Wrecking Ball uh, video, I said, okay, I gotta do something about that. That's where it came from. For Spoke TV, I'm Kelly Burns. The new web-based teaching delivery system at Conestoga is still causing some problems for staff and students. Desire to Learn was brought in last September after moving on from their previous system, Angel. 
Spoke TV's Steve Brzezinski examines the drawbacks and the benefits. Desire to Learn, or D2L, has been in use at Conestoga College for close to a year now, but isn't making communication between staff and students better. Those at Conestoga are still getting accustomed to the new technology. Professor and coordinator at Conestoga College, Kim Denstedt, shares her experience. Um, however, I would say with D2L, there's a few issues. I find the I find the email system a little cumbersome, and it took me two or three tries to figure out how to actually get an email sent because there's several different clicks that you have to go through. Regardless of the apparent problems, D2L still strives to be an effective and quick communication medium between professors and their students. As Software Network Administrator at D2L, Curtis Price explains. And it allows them to work in an environment where everything is interactive. So a teacher may put up uh, sort of uh, documentation about the course, something to do with calculus, but then at the same time put up problems that you can do online which give you instant feedback so there's no time in waiting for a teacher to give you oh you're right oh you're wrong but the desire to learn website is still undergoing changes and price affirms that any new obstacles students encounter will be met head-on by the company we don't shy away from problem we don't try and hide it we don't try and mask it we deal with it in the future d2l may offer more for graduates allowing users to publish their own content develop an online resume and ePortfolio. For Spoke TV, I'm Steve Brzezinski. A local professor at the University of Guelph has won a prestigious teaching award. Molly Mercier talked to the recipient of Canada's top teaching honour. The first day that I walked down Weingard Walk, I felt like this was home. This is where I was always supposed to be. Jacqueline Murray, professor at the University of Guelph, is one of the 10 recipients of the 3M Fellowship Award this year and the 15th professor at the U of G to receive it since the award has existed. The 3M Fellowship Award is the highest ranking teacher's award in Canada. Jacqueline is a medieval historian and also the director of first year seminars at the U of G and exudes nothing but passion about her job, students and school. I think an award like this is a, a wonderful way of reaffirming how important the university itself takes teaching and takes the, uh, the education of students and fostering student learning. Samuel Mushini, a fourth year political science major at U of G, not only knows Murray as a professor from his first year, but has yeah. also had the pleasure of working alongside her in his third year, co-facilitating one of her first year <laughs> seminars. And she does really treat all of her students as peers, so like it never feels like she's your instructor, but rather she's someone working with you, which I thought was really cool for a professor. Um, and you know, she uh, encourages students to call her by her first name, so even that aspect is quite unique. Like with most professors, there usually isn't quite that close of an interaction. For Spoke TV, I'm Molly Mercier. With the Christian population expanding every day, Richard Keese takes an in-depth look at a local organization that is spreading the faith of Christianity across China. One Fergus local is trying to bring Christianity to China for the people who want it, while juggling family life and dealing with potential political issues. John Dolman is the executive director of Chinese Church Support Ministries, a nonprofit organization dedicated to bringing Christianity to China. In Canada are to manage and run um, a base office um, to spread the news throughout Canada uh, of the plight of the church in China. Chinese Church Support Ministries was founded in 1986 and was originally based in England. Now the organization has branched out and has several locations globally. John explains that China's Christian population is growing at an extreme rate. Some estimates put it at 30,000 new believers a day. Um, the more um, Conservative estimates, mine for example, would probably be somewhere between 20 and 25,000 believers, new believers every day. John's branch of the organization works on the printing and distribution of religious texts for use in China, as well as training new leaders. Challenges to train leaders. The reason that we print the material that we print and distribute it freely to these church churches is that they'll be able to train new leaders. John also runs missions trips to China with his local church, on top of the work he does for his organization. The pastor of the Fergus Pentecostal Church explains the purpose of the missions fine. trips. We're, we're good with that. Um, but yes, uh, we've had a team 
go uh, to China this past year uh, with John for a couple of weeks, working in a, an orphanage there, um, as well as um, helping some of the workers there and spending time with them, teaching and just fellowship with them. John goes to China about three times a year, but his wife Chris usually doesn't tag along. Chris explains what the couple times she has gone has been like. The first time I hated the place. <laughs> um, the second time, I didn't really hate the place, um, but I came back and I really, um, I had a concern for the people that lived there, the Westerners that were working there really was where my concern was, because they're so far away from home and just quite lonely people. Chris has led her own missions trip to China to offer support to the Western workers there. She also mentions what it is like having John away and having one of her sons and her grandchildren living in China. It's a long way away. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not as far away as uh, many, a few years ago it would have been because there is Skype, so we can, we can talk on Skype, we can talk on the phones. Um, the, the most difficult times, I think, are when there's sickness, when, when one, one of the kids are poorly or, or whatever. Um, and then I feel a very long way away. Missionaries sometimes face challenges for the work they are doing in China. Openly spreading Christianity or promoting worship in large groups can see them facing arrest or deportation. So the Western concept of the megachurch, sort of a thousand people plus, um, is not really viable at all in China because once you reach a thousand, the government shut you down. The organization also struggles to keep up with the high growth of Christianity and aren't always able to accommodate the high demand for resources and literature. He's, he's wor he works with a large organization, so there, there are a number of, uh, there are actually several countries involved with, with the work that they do. And then each of those countries um, takes kind of a, a piece of the work that that mission is doing. So John's is primarily literature, so they, they print a lot of books, they distribute Bibles, they do all that kind of stuff. But despite the challenges, John feels dedicated to the organization's cause and feels that the people at the local church support him and his continuing efforts in China. Uh, the positive side of the church in China is that when you put the church underground, it's like putting it in a pressure cooker, and it grows phenomenally. For Spoke TV, I'm Richard Keast. A Guelph-based photographer brings social issues to light through his work. A university student is profiled by Spoke TV's Rebecca Turner. Also keep, that also keep it moving like the one we did. Yanni Makute is not the average photographer. I got started uh, 2010, December. I, it was Christmas season, and I saw these pictures online about this, um, you know, the bokeh effect background, and there's a lot of Christmas lights in the background, and I'm like, that's a really cool shot. I'm going to get myself a nice DSLR camera. So I did that, and then it grew from there. The Guelph-based photographer uses his craft to bring important social issues to light, one of which is spreading a message of LGBT equality. Makute fashioned his own version of the No Hate campaign. The No Hate campaign is a photographic protest for marriage equality that started in California in 2008 and encourages independent photographers to create their own interpretations of the project. That was when, that was the time when I just came out and then I thought, well, first of all, I came from like a very suppressed background, I guess, like Christian background, and then it was very hard being growing up as a gay man. And then so when I came out, I'm like, I want to do something. I want to prove to them, to the Christian people, that being gay is okay. So I gathered all my people, my friends, and we did a No Hate photo shoot. And I thought it was very successful. Those who worked with Yanni on the No Hate campaign say that it was a very liberating experience. So it, it was great, like, breaking out of my shell and not having to uh, worry about anything like that, right? So for once, I was speaking out basically about the issues and showing my support. That I'm from a country that isn't really for gay, um, Jamaica. And I remember my parents asking me about the no hate photo shoot. And it was like my first time thinking for myself and being able to say that I don't see anything wrong. I'm being proud to say that I don't see anything wrong with being gay. Makute also came up with his own creative ways to prompt social change. <laughs> I also did this photo shoot with a bunch of my friends. The whole concept of the picture is there's 
there were two gay men in the background with gay flag wrapping around and then there's on the other side of the picture there's this one lady i guess she re represents the community it's just a picture that represents that there are some people still in the world that are not very accepting with the gay community his photography also focuses on themes like feminism and multiculturalism. Yvette Kabamba models for Makute and admires his unique vision. I think what it is is that Yanni has many visions. He's a man of, uh, he's very creative, so he likes to explore different types of things. From one time he's doing hair, next thing he's doing high fashion, and then he's doing more natural and paints. So he likes to try new things, and it's really interesting to work with someone who's open to so many ideas. If you're going to do something like photography, which already captures a lot of attention, and then you mix in a message that you want to get across, it's like you're killing two birds with one stone, right? So I think that was a very good idea. Makute is not just a photographer, however. He also balances work and a full-time education at the University of Guelph. It's very hard. <laughs> it's very hard. I'm taking six courses right now. I'm also taking, I mean, doing three jobs, which includes the photography, the student life at the school, um, and a part-time job, retail job at the mall. And it's very hard. I'm very thankful for my eye calendar. <laughs> Without it, I don't know how to survive in this busy schedule. And Makute says that with a bit of hard work, other aspiring photographers can also forge their own path in the industry. Um, it's all about um, a lot of reading online, YouTube videos, it's very helpful, and some other people's comments about photography. Good, we got the shots. For Spoke TV, I'm Rebecca Turner. With award season wrapped up, Sarah Schilling compares the Hollywood hits of 2013 and examines what goes into the making of an Oscar nomination. Between actors, directors, and genres, there can be many factors that make a film noteworthy. And the Oscar goes to... 2013 was a year of great films with such a variety on the big screen. This year's nine Academy Award nominated films included American Hustle, Captain Phillips, Dallas Buyers Club, Gravity, Her, Nebraska, That's right. Philomena, 12 Years a Slave, and The Wolf of Wall Street. With award season coming to an end, however, many actors, directors, and producers are gearing up for their new projects and getting ready for the 2014 award season. But what makes an award-winning film? With an abundance of winners since the first Academy Awards in 1929, many directors, writers, and producers ask themselves this very question. Many wonder if a specific genre is the key to Hollywood gold. But with titles like Chicago, Million Dollar Baby, The King's Speech, The Artist, and last year's winner Argo, Thank it looks you. like Thank genre you. has nothing to do with it. With Sometimes but, uh, critically acclaimed actors like Daniel Day-Lewis, Meryl Streep, or Sean Penn guarantee wins. Um, but what about those diamonds in the rough, like the artist Jean Dujardin, that helps Octavia Spencer, or the late Philip Seymour Hoffman for his portrayal of Truman Capote. Many algorithms have been developed over the years to see if specific words used in internet movie database summaries, $41 million budgets, or even specific words in titles make a film a winner. With so many different factors, from the audience the to the this voters is, uh, and the films themselves, who's to say what makes the perfect film? No one knows for sure, but one thing is certain. No matter who wins, Hollywood generates Beasts magic on the, the big Southern screen. Wild. For Spoke TV, I'm Sarah Schilling. As two weeks of Olympic competition have come to an end, our nation is feeling inspired. But is it enough to keep people active, or is it just a short-term fix? Heather Mighton has more. It's never too late to start living a healthy lifestyle, and if Canada's recent success in Sochi has inspired you, you are certainly not alone. Pursuing a healthier life may be on the minds of many, but how many of us are actually getting up off the couch and making a change? Sports psychologist Kim Dawson thinks that although Canadian Olympic success can help create a sense of national identity, it's not doing much more. 
They unite us as a culture, and we certainly saw that with the hockey wins. But on an individual behavioral change aspect of it, it's a very hard link for people to say, we won a gold medal in men's hockey, I should get off the couch and walk around the block. Dawson thinks that the emphasis that is placed on elite athlete success has a direct effect at the recreational level of physical activity in Canada. Now, the model is not working on any type of outcome measure that you take. So are we sending more kids to the Olympics? Are we sending more kids to scholarships? No. Are we having? Are we becoming more fit as a nation? Absolutely not. There is no lack of interest from the younger generation and many of them are encouraged to try new sport after watching fellow Canadians succeed on the world stage. Well, when you hear all the uh, Olympian stories, like their backstories and commercials and all those things, it makes you think that any, anyone in the world could do something just as successful as that. A sentiment that is a echoed by Dawson. Sport. And that's what I'm hoping is happening, is that they get inspired because they didn't know that a sport existed. For Spoke TV, I'm Heather Mighton. The Conestogo women's volleyball team has had a very successful season, although they have recently been eliminated from the final eight tournament in the OCAA. The Lady Condors advanced to the tournament after pulling off a nail-biting win against Canadore College. Conestoga College's women's volleyball team faced off against Canada or College in the round of 16 in OCAA action. The Condors took the first two sets before letting the Panthers force a fifth and final set. Eventually, the Condors would come out on top. Coach Merritt Gwodes was satisfied with the result. Perseverance was a key word for Absolutely. us. I mean, we, we stuck in, you know, we dug deep, 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 and we finally won it. 1917. <laughs> The population of monarch butterflies has been chopped in half in the last year alone. The decline in their population has scientists looking at their habitats and the environment for answers. This year the monarch butterfly population is the lowest it's been since record keeping began in 1994. As low as these numbers are, many people don't realize the important role that the monarch plays. Jennifer Tremere, education coordinator at the Cambridge Butterfly Conservatory, explains their importance. Monarch butterflies, like all butterflies, are valuable pollinators, so they help with our food supply. And the decrease in the amount of monarch population is also suggestive of a decrease in pollinating insect populations, which has a tremendous impact for our potential food supply in the future. The migratory monarch's numbers reached upwards of 1 billion in 1994. That number was closer to 66 million last year, and this year it is half of that. The drop of almost 50% in the monarch butterfly population last year isn't as important as the fact that the overall number is dropping. It's harder for a smaller population to recover. These declines are said to be caused by a few factors, but one of the main reasons is environmental. What could possibly be done to help this species recover? Stephen Murphy, Chair and Professor of Environment and Resource Studies at the University of Waterloo, shares a possible solution. So the big thing would be to sort of look at some of the mitigation, some of the pollution effects, and then some of the larger range of climate change, actually. And that's kind of for all species, not just monarchs. They happen to be attractive. They happen to be something that people often care a lot about, actually, out of there. So a pretty complicated one, but I think the biggest thing would be to sort of immediately look at the habitat side of it, actually. For Spoke TV, I'm Steve Spire. That's all we have for you this week. For Spoke TV from Conestoga College, I'm Caitlin McKenzie-Keys. And I'm John Morris. For more news and information, visit SpokeTV.ca.